hi guys, I'm Trey. I'm a third year medical student, student or just finished my third year at BART. Um, I'm going to be interviewing next year and I'm also the Becoming a Doctor GP portfolio lead. So we've organized this panel with Dr. Patel, Dr. Baptiste and Tash um, to give a mixed student uh, and GP collaborative sort of panel on approach to thinking about uh, why we should consider GP as a career and what we can do outside of GP and all the opportunities that you have available. Um, so I think um, GP does ha uh, get a bit of um, slack at times. So I think it might be quite good to discuss um, what are the benefits of choosing this other career as well? Um, so, should we go around and introduce ourselves? Uh, Tash, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Tash. Um, I've just finished my third year at King's College London. Um, I'm also going to be indicating next year, and I'm actually indicating in primary care um, at King's. So, I am looking to study, uh, looking to um, work in GP potentially um, once that time comes. Um, and I'm quite interested in sort of getting rid of that stigma surrounding GP is boring and why would you want to do that? <laughs> so really interesting to, um, excited to talk to you guys today. And Dr. So I guess I'll go next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I'm Patrice, um, I'm a portfolio GP. Um, so I'm sure we're gonna discuss that in a bit more detail, but it basically means that I spend some time in clinical practice and then the rest of my week, I do a number of other things. So that could be business, that could be teaching medical students, examining, et cetera, et cetera. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, I'm, I don't know how much to say in the intro because I know we're gonna discuss so much. So I'll keep it brief and then I'll talk a bit more in detail a bit later on. Sure. Uh, Dr. Patel, can you hear us now? Not sure she can hear us just yet. Um, mm. So I think what we'll do is I'll start off the initial first question and then um, I think that will give her enough time to join in. So I initially just wanted to start off by uh, asking why are you, well, Nash, why are you considering a GP right now? And why, um, Patrice, have you already considered GP and that's your chosen career? So, Tash, so, do you want to go? Or do you want to... <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I'm interested in GP for so many reasons. I think I have always considered myself quite a generalist. So, the kind of options I'm considering are sort of emergency medicine, GP. Um, I like how varied it is. Um, I like how you can see one patient with maybe a physical health complaint and then, you know, the next minute it's mental health. Um, and the next moment you're just giving general life advice. Um, I like that a big part of it is reassurance. So a lot of people say, isn't it so boring because you're seeing people with sort of viral illnesses and sprained ankles and that part of me still really interests me because you know, you're reassuring someone that it's okay and they can just have some rest and be all right. Um, on the flip side of that, you're literally the front line of patients present, potentially presenting with life-threatening illnesses. You're potentially the first patient, um, the first point of contact for someone maybe presenting with um, a cancer diagnosis, for example, and it's your job to be so switched on and make sure that you, you know, refer them to the right place if that's necessary. Um, I really like how you can do sort of like um, Patrice does, does, you know, some time in clinic and then um, do, do something else with the rest of your time, which I'm excited to hear from Patrice what she does. Um, yeah, I think, I think I've sort of covered my main reasons. I also like the hours. Like, let's be honest, I don't really want to work evenings and weekends if I don't have to. Um, I speak very openly about that. I, I want a life outside of my career and I think GP does give you the chance to do that. <laughs> Oh gosh. <laughs> um, so I'll go next. Um, so I think Tash, you've covered quite a bit. I think what you were saying is the variety in general. Uh, it's really dark. I don't know why. Sorry. Um, I have put my lights on, but I guess I'm not getting enough daylight window, um, light from the window. Um, so yeah, variety for me was number one. Um, I think I probably should start to when I actually wanted to, or I applied to the GP training program. Um, that was when I was taking a year out of training and at that point where I was really burnt out, I had done a couple of years in the founder in the in the NHS, 
and I wasn't really enjoying it and then I became a little bit unwell and I had to take some time off um and then throughout my year I was really just deciding you know do I uh, do I want to um, go back into what I call the system, the NHS. And it was during that time that I realized actually the passion was still there. I still wanted to be a doctor. It was how can I navigate this system? How can I still be the doctor that I envisioned and that I want to be? Um, but I still have to go back into the system. So how can I do that? So um, I thought GP was actually the best specialty to pick. Um, and I chose general practice because I felt number one, to be the doctor I had envisioned, to get to know my patients. We often, we know in general practice that we have very short appointment times. But equally in the hospital, I felt very rough when I was seeing my patients. If you're in A&E, you know, you're under pressure to breach and you see them in a short amount of time. I didn't like the fact that I wouldn't get to follow my patients up. Yes, of course, if you're a specialist and you're in clinic, you see your patients, but it might be some time between that. And for me in general practice, there is that follow up. And I have a really nice, not nice, but I have a lot of patients that me and that always come back to see me. And I have a really um, good uh, rapport and relationship with my patients. So for me, it was about that as well. And um, I think also working in a close knit team and having a base. Um, again, when I was a trainee, uh all the moving around it just got me down a little bit i just didn't like to keep moving so often and i didn't want to keep doing that for the next five six seven plus years so for me general practice enabled me to or enables me to have a base get team really well and to just have that foundation and of course there are so many opportunities within general practice Yes, you can have a portfolio career, as I like to call it, versus portfolio GP. Um, there's just so many things you can do. It's really limitless. And I think potentially that's not something that's explored or that people necessarily see straight away when they think of general practitioners. And like Tash was saying, going back to variety, we see so many different types of patients. And it's the holistic care as well. Um, I worked in palliative medicine for six months, and that was really where I saw holistic care at its best and in general practice that's another specialty where you can actually see the patient as a whole treat them as a whole um and i just find in the hospital sometimes it just just didn't happen i know i worked in surgical hdu and you know <laughs> there wasn't really in holistic care <laughs> so um that was really frustrating to me because some patients you know they'll pass away and they didn't have the input from the palliative care team that they potentially could have had um and it just was very frustrating so there's a whole host of reasons and those are some of them in a nutshell <laughs> and um Pyle, can you hear us now yes i can hear you sorry about uh, that. so all you've missed so far is just a general introduction and why have you considered gp so i think you can right. go next yeah, I mean, I think um, both of you have covered what I would have said, really. I think for me, it started from when I was really, really young. I was really fond of my GP. I loved that he saw all members of my family. Um, back in the day, you know, they were on the phone and we could ring them around the clock, which isn't the case right now. But there's still a lot of continuity of care. And I think I just love having my patient pool. I am a, a sort of a port portfolio GP, if you like, but I have a, a regular base of patients that I see on a, on a on a on a weekly basis so and and i i just i just love that um which 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 is something that you don't necessarily get in hospital medicine so and the rest of it is is, is all the stuff that you've already covered yeah and i think that brings us on to a few of the questions that we've been asked so everyone please feel free to ask the questions in the chat i'll get to it at some point during this uh, discussion um but uh, Patrice, you mentioned a portfolio GP. So one of our questions so far has been, what is a portfolio GP? I think for me, I like the term portfolio career um, because there are a lot of GPs who, I suppose are called a portfolio GP, but then they don't necessarily things, loads of things in general practice. They may you know have a company and work in business so for me i like the term portfolio career because it basically means you have a number of careers and a number of interests and for me i've been quite fortunate because my portfolio career is just an amalgamation of all the things i like to do it started when i took my year out of training and i got back into all the things I'm doing so one of the big things i love doing is writing i find it very therapeutic 
Um, and throughout my year out, I was just writing for loads of different places, uh, the BMJ, uh, Support for Doctors Network, just loads of different places and reignited my passion really. And I also got back into writing poetry. So I now write for GP online um, regularly. So that's one of the things that I do. During my year out, <laughs> I also started a medical careers company, um, which is basically aimed at primarily aspiring medics to educate and inform them about a career in medicine. Um, it's really important to me because, as you heard, I was at a crossroads when I wasn't, I'm, I thought I was going to leave medicine. So for me, it's really important that if you're considering a career in medicine, you do know that I've done your research. And then if the you know aspiring medics decide that they want to uh, choose a medical career then we can support them with that we also do support doctors as well so that's the career um, the company in a bit of a nutshell um, I love teaching um, and I do that through my careers company but also I teach medical students um, I'll be taking on a cohort at my practice this September um, I also examine medical students at Queen Mary University um, I've all, last year I signed up to be a GMC examiner. Well, I, I say I signed up. You have to actually go for assessments, etc. Um, a bit, <laughs> a bit more in detail than that. But um, I'm a GMC examiner. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a speaker. I speak at loads of different events. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things that I do, and it's just all the things that I enjoy. Uh, so that's a portfolio career uh, or portfolio GP, but. Equally, there are so many different things you can do with um, uh, the you know, general practice and having a portfolio career, which I'm sure we'll touch on uh, in detail a little bit later. Yeah, we'll go into it uh, much more because I know there's some interest uh, regarding especially medical education within the GP role itself. Um, we do have a, quite a few questions here about special interests. And I think, Kyle, you can come in here because I am aware that you have a special interest in dermatology, which is... Um, something that I, um, I'm quite a fan of, and I'm thinking of GP with a special interest in dermatology as well down the line. Um, so we've got a couple of questions where it's like, what is the process of pursuing a special interest alongside GP? Um, and someone actually mentioned dermatology as well, um, with subspecializing. And they've said, I've heard from doctors that you get less pay subspecializing compared to just being in one speciality, and your role in the subspeciality doesn't allow you to carry out all the work in that area. Okay, so um, can you hear me? Because I think a few people have said they can't hear me. Yeah. Okay, so um, I decided, to, so I, I became a GP. I've had two kids, so this is a bit of a protractor. So I, be, I became a GP and then I had my two children. So it's a, it was a long period of time. So it's nothing to do with how long it took me to train to become a, a GP with special interest in de dermatology. But what I did was I did a diploma in um, practical dermatology at Cardiff University. So it gave me an opportunity to kind of go back to university and I did it over two years. So it is a really nice paced diploma um, and it's a lot of written um, tests and coursework. It is a lot of work, but it's it's really, really interesting. And if you like dermatology, I highly recommend that course. It's all distance learning. So you can do it from your sofa or from your home study. Um, you don't need to travel to Cardiff. Um, so it's, it's and, and um you, you basically gain um, quite a depth of knowledge, actually. Um, I don't know about other students on here and other medical students here and other doctors here, but dermatology teaching at my university was really, really poor. So I basically started with pretty basic knowledge. Um, and then from there, it was kind of like deciding what do you do with it? Because a lot of people do these diplomas, but then don't know what to do with it. So I spoke to um, a few GP practices and I, um, I work in a really busy suburban practice and I looked at the referral process for dermatology. So I looked at how many patients we were referring, how many of them were appropriate referrals to secondary care. And then, and then I looked at how I could improve that and how I could improve the patient experience within the general practice for dermatology. So a lot of patients were being referred for, say, eczema, acne, you know, could we could we try and help them in general practice in a community clinic? So what I've done is slightly different to what a normal gypsy would do or a GP with special interest in dermatology, is I've set up a community clinic for my trust, for my CCG within my area. So what I do is I, if you like, I vet all the referrals. So there's about 34,000 patients within this PCN and I vet all of those referrals. I get to see all of them. 
and decide if they're appropriate to be referred on to secondary care. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So um, it's really, really rewarding because while, when patients are waiting six months to a year to see the, a secondary care dermatologist, it's, it's quite frustrating for them, particularly if they've got really bad eczema or acne or psoriasis. Um, so I do my best to use my expertise to try and bridge the gap, if you like. Um, yeah. And then uh, alongside that, obviously, I work as a GP within that PCN as well. So it's quite quite nice for me because I, I can tie in the two practices quite nicely. And how often do you do both? Or is it just something that's pretty much every day? So I do uh, uh, six sessions. So that's three days of general practice within my, my, my PCN. And I also do, um, so I then do two sessions of dermatology, okay. a, a bit of minor ops as well. So that's moving minor lesions and so that sort of stuff. Okay. And someone just asked regarding to uh, the diploma, is it something that you can do before graduating? I assume because it's a postgraduate diploma, you'd have to do it after, but. Um... Yeah, do it in GP training though. Okay. So uh, a few of my friends did it within general practice training. So it is possible. It's a lot of work, but I don't recommend it. But I think soon after is a good idea. <laughs> okay. And do GPs with special interests earn more? Um, that's a really uh, interesting question, actually, because, yes, they don't get paid very much if you're doing a session within the hospital as a GP SI. Um, <laughs> I think there are ways around it and I think you need to work out yeah. what your niche is and how you can, what services you can offer your, your trust really. Um, but yeah, you can, you can, you can earn a pretty good pay. I, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, it's any more than an average GP pay, but you just need to speak to your, your colleagues about it. And um, Tash, I think I'd just bring you in here. So obviously we're years away from qualifying and um, deciding what speciality to go into. But you did mention your uh, your interpolating next year in primary care. So do you just want to discuss a little bit about why you made that choice about, I wouldn't say committing to primary care early, but um, still going with a sort of a speciality route very early when there's loads of interpolation options where I just you know, more like anatomy, pharmacology or something much more broader. Sure. Yeah, so I did a um, student selected module last year in health and marginalised groups. Um, and I spent just a day in a GP practice in central London, um, which um, just looks after the population. Um, and I found this so eye opening. And I think I really like the holistic care of it, um, you know, helping people with all sorts of things, housing applications, just everything. Um, and I saw how much of a difference that GP really made to those patients' lives. Um, and subsequently, I've done some sort of reading around um, GPs and prisons. Um, and just I really, really get the impression that these are hugely rewarding roles. Um, so I found that the primary care um, intercalated degree, I can choose sort of the health in health inequalities sort of um, pathway, if you like. Um, I'd really recommend anyone, if you're interested in this sort of thing, reading um, The Health Gap by Michael Marmot. Marmo? I don't really know how you pronounce it, but I can write that in the chat. Um, and that just sort of really sparked that sort of um, <laughs> light in my brain, if you like. Um, but sort of, I've always been interested in like the special interest um, pathway as well. Like I'm very sort of the key mental health advocate um and although i kind of don't want to go into psychiatry which a lot of people are like why not but you know gp as far as i'm aware as a medical student is very heavy mental health orientated um so yeah i think that might answer your question yeah that sounds good um we've got a quite a different question now um how is it being a gp in a hospital i don't know if you've ever had any experience with that outside of training as a gp um so yeah, question. Uh, What's the question? Sorry. So, how is it being a GP in a health? In and who a was it to? Was it... Uh, I didn't say to oh. anyone. So I guess we could all. Just... <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I've done some... so. I don't do any work in the do hospital. Go want... oh, no, go ahead. Okay. So hospital, I'm assuming by hospital GP, you mean A&E GP? 
because Amy is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, if you like a bit of um, sort of you know, a bit of suturing, a bit of removing bits and bobs, fixing things a little bit, alongside a bit of general practice, it is really fun, and I highly recommend it as a as a side thing. <laughs> And um, I mean, the so only thing I'll add that to that, are... yeah, go for it. I, I was going to add something. Um, there is, I don't know, yeah, it, uh, so as a GP trainee, you have to do some out of hours work. You can also do telephone triage and NHS 111, uh, which you obviously can do as a GP. So there's that aspect as well. Um, I mean, me, I mean, in, in, urgent, in the urgent care center as a GP, you have your clinic. And you see pretty much similar cases that you would in general practice. You do see some acute things which you refer on to the specialty. Um, so the pay is actually okay. It's, it's, it's okay. It's good. You even do nights as well, which the pay is a little bit higher. Um, but it just depends on what you want to do. I personally don't. <laughs> I did consider it. I think actually working for NHS 111 is actually pretty good. I have a, a few... Uh, friends who are doing that and they said that they love it so it actually is something you can consider uh, we've got some questions about the GP training pathway um, don't know if uh, Patrice or Kyle which one of you wants to take that um, but yeah we've got a couple of questions about what the pathway is like how is it organized and how much of it is hospital compared to GP based do you want to take that, Patrice? Because I think you're probably more a fave with what goes I on can... at the moment. <laughs> Just recently qualified, so I'll, I'll take that. Uh, um, so if you're full-time, the training program is three years. Uh, there are programs if you want to do an academic uh, or global health uh, program. I did the standard three-year training program. It's 18 months in the hospital, 18 months in general practice. Um, my 18 months was comprised of OBS and gynae, care of the elderly and palliative medicine. So kind of not a hospital, but still not, not GP basically. Um, so it depends where you are based. My rotations were six months. Um, and then you, again, like foundation training, you'll have a supervisor, you know, you'll what, learn learn the specialty. Um, you have to do assessments throughout. You have to complete an audit. You have to do a re audit or quality improvement project. Um, you have two exams to take. So you have the AKT or applied knowledge test, which you can only take in your second year. Um, just a written computer test, and then you take your CSA or clinical skills assessment in your final year SC three. Uh, that's Basically, the GP training program. Um, I mean, again, where you, what rotations you get and where you're placed, you have to take an exam to get onto, or a few exams to get onto the GP training program. Anything in medicine that determines where you're based, um, how high you score. So that's basically the GP training program. I hope I've answered the question <laughs> as much as possible. Um, no, I definitely think you did. Um, just a few questions based on what you just said. Um, what specialities do you think are the best to work in as a junior doctor if you want to become a GP? Uh, I think, well, my argument is that we should just have our rotations in general practice. <laughs> That's my argument. Um, Fair enough. I think a range of uh, so. I mean, a lot of people think, okay, so you you know, you should have P's and OBS. What you did as a foundation doctor, I mean, I did four months of care of the elderly, and then I did six months of care of the elderly as a GP trainee. I mean, I couldn't really help that, but it would have been great if I had done something else, like, you know, maybe P's. But I think when you're in general practice, if you're a trainee, you do get exposed to so much, and you get exposed to what you're going to see day to day. So actually, my argument is, rotate through specialties but actually if you had a six or months or a year or more in general practice I think it would put you in good stead for actually being a really good GP and I think often when you're in the hospital it's a little bit more on service delivery obviously depending on where you are um, the specialty trainees are prioritized for certain things definitely obs and gynae okay I don't really want to go to theatre but you know there might be a few things 
um, but as a GP trainee, you're not necessarily prioritise. So I think it's good to get a range of specialties, but equally, if you didn't get a, a rotation in paediatrics, once you're in your final year of GP training, you see loads of children and you see loads of acute cases and you definitely know how to recognise a sick child. So I wouldn't get too worried on, oh, I haven't done a rotation in A&E or I haven't done a rotation in peds or obs and gynae because actually you'll pick quite a lot up when you're in your last year. And often many uh, foundation doctors, once they've finished the, the foundation programme, or FY4, in which most people actually do broaden their horizons and do more, um, have more experience in different specialties. So there's opportunities then to, you know, broaden your horizons and, and have more experience. So I wouldn't be too worried, but I would do is going to help you. Like I said, I did 10 months of care of the elderly, and we know we have an aging population, and a lot of the patients are elderly. So there I am moaning about having 10 months of general. Of, of general but actually it has really helped me so whatever you have whatever you're assigned to it will definitely help yeah that's good to know um one thing i did want to uh discuss and bring up was the role of social media as a doctor as a gp um as a healthcare professional um i know all three of you have uh, various different types of platforms that you do use um to connect with an audience so Tash, if we just start with you um, I know that you said that you're a keen mental health advocate, and I've seen that a lot on Instagram as well. Um, is this something that um, I imagine that you will want to continue um, throughout med school? Um, and what do you see for it in the future as a uh, practicing clinician as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think sort of a lot of my Instagram, I talk about my personal experiences, but my main motive is to sort of break the stigma um, well, on a whole surrounding mental health, but sort of more focused surrounding mental health and, um, and doctors, because as you know, the stats show the prevalence of mental health in the medical profession is shocking. Um, you know, female suicide rates, doctors is awful um and i think there's you know a lot of stigma surrounding the fact that doctors can't sort of speak up about the fact that they have illnesses on a whole and sort of why shouldn't they be able to because you know <laughs> doctors are humans um that sounds so obvious saying that but i think you know people don't really realize that and you know me you know thinking with sort of a patient hat on i'd much rather go to a gp who's sort of maybe had experiences that i'm now experiencing because the advice um that they give me i'll definitely sort of want to take it on board a lot more um and you know probably you know thinking more being professional it's not really your place in a gp consultation to go i've had depression as well but you know if there's sort of an indirect message that patients then know that you know doctors medical students are speaking more openly about the fact that they've suffered from depression anxiety bipolar you name it whatever um then they might think oh maybe she has you know experienced what i'm going through too if that kind of makes sense um, and just more on the whole, I think, you know, there are lots of support services available for doctors and other medical um, healthcare professionals um, for mental health illnesses. But I don't think they're spoken about a lot and people don't really know where to access them. And yeah, that's kind of my motive, um, just to get people speaking about it a lot more norm norm normally, because unfortunately it is a very normal thing. Yeah, I 100% agree. And it's been quite refreshing to see posts like that. Um, and I like the fact that you do it quite frequently and just put the message out there. Um, Patrice, I know that you've got a YouTube channel. Just wanted to see um, what what made you go for the YouTube channel and um, what your plans are with it as well. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, my YouTube channel is very new. Um, I think I saw that there was a bit of a gap, really. Um, so I've seen quite a few doctors on YouTube, um, a few GPs, but um, I felt there was something missing. Um, which I hopefully have filled that void. Um, I talk a lot about, so my channel is really, it's not just about general practice. It's about inspiration, careers, non-medical and medical careers, although there is admittedly a lot of medical careers at the moment um, and it's about being positive um so it's all about that but yes at the moment there are a lot of gp videos um because i do feel as we've touched upon practice needs a bit more attention it needs to be put in a bit more of a positive 
and there are so many things you can do with this career. So I talk all about general practice. I talk about the opportunities. Um, I talk about why I chose a career in general practice. I talk about the pros and cons to a career in general practice. I talk about so many different things. Um, and also about mental health. Um, I have written some articles, again, during my year of training um, about mental health among medical students and doctors. And I've just um, released a video yesterday about a work-life balance, which does touch on some issues um, among medical students and doctors with regards to mental health. So I try to cover a range of different topics. Um, as I say, it's very new, but there are plans to do so much more. I'm launching a new series called Patient's Perspective, which, like we've touched on, is about care, the patient's perspective, what do they want to talk about, we help them uh, more as doctors, what can we do better, what can we change, coming out in August. Um, and then there's a few other series that I've got in the pipeline. So they just want, there's so many things that I, I want to talk about, and I feel YouTube is such a great place to do that. Um, but yes, GP's at the forefront, but it's not the only so make sure you check it out if you haven't already subscribed <laughs> yeah make sure you check out patrice but also tash's channel as well because i know um tash has one too. um pearl i know you have an instagram page called the blushing doc um it's very much like um healthcare nutrition based um what was your uh starting idea for that page and what made you want to do it I think, uh, to be honest, I, I didn't really want it to be like a GP platform, but I think being a GP, you're always going to, you know, have questions from people um, about your job. Um, I mainly started it was because I wanted to show people that I'm not just a GP. I think people's perspective of a GP is, you know, they go to work, they go home, read a book, and go to bed. I think, anyway, and that's not the case. You know, we do have a life outside. We're pretty normal people. And you know, I, you know, I love cooking. So food is my other big passion in life. And um, I'm actually looking into doing a culinary medicine diploma at the moment. So um, I want to the next level, I want to, I want to look into food and how it, how it works in our society today, and what it can do to help our mental health, our, our general um, healthy living. And you know, it's just a start. Oh, I think we may have lost her. Um, okay, I think what we'll do is we'll carry oh, on and then bring her back. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure where she's gone, but we'll just move on for now. Um, yeah, we can so leave we any sort of like um, social medias and Instagrams at the end of the talk as well. So that's fine. I've got a question from Jade here about the WASP program. Now, I'm not that familiar with it, but Jade has explained that is that she understands that you have two weeks training in a GP setting. Do you think that's enough time to get a real insight into the role of GPs? Uh, hmm. I think when it's difficult to um, gain experience or to get enough research if you're not doing the career already or the specialty already. I think like Tash was saying, she had one day that basically, you know, sparked further have her passion further and her interest further into general practice so it depends on i guess the type of person you are um and how you utilize the experience someone could get so much from two weeks someone else who may not feel that they've achieved or they've gained that much so i think it does depend um how you get the better so of course two weeks for me potentially may not have been enough i probably would have liked a little bit more but i think there's so much you can get from two weeks but it's about how you use the experience so make sure that you have a plan going forward if you're not sure of how to utilize the experience speak to the piece speak to you know maybe your peers who have had some experience before and for me i love to plan i love to prepare so i'd probably go over plan what can i do what clinics can i go to who can i speak to do i want to sit with a nurse do i want to go in the community what services are available so i would have like a whole list of things that i'd want to um explore and that's probably what i would say to make the most out of the two weeks and yeah you can get so much out of it that sounds good oh okay i think we got Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my IT us? today. 
that's okay, that's fine. Um, I think what I did want to touch upon, and I think this would be a really good question to get both a student and a GP perspective, especially from Patrice, I know you are taking a cohort of medical students in September. Um, how do you make the most of your GP placements as a medical student? And I think we can start with Tash to get the student perspective of how to make the most of your placements, and then we can see it from a GP perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, I think Patrice just mentioned it. I did work experience at a GP before I did medicine, so that was kind of my work experience. Um, and I actually sat in with like every person in the GP practice, so like a phlebotomist, a nurse, um, even like the admin team. Um, I think that's super important and sort of that might be something that you have to kind of actively seek outside of um, university because I know from my GP placement we were just um, sat with a GP which obviously was really useful but I think if you want to career in GP it's great to have an understanding of how the whole team works as any area that you go into medicine is always going to be about the multidisciplinary team so if you have an understanding of that I think that's only a good thing. Um, I think sort of actively try and ask questions and talk to patients i know that's kind of like a general advice but i know sort of when i first started i was so scared to talk to a patient um but just get used to it um yeah and enjoy it yeah i pr pretty much have to echo the same thing that um tash has got to say in terms of making the most of your placements just to speak to people and have a curious mind and ask questions because i think that's the best way of building rapport with anyone that you're speaking to anyway um so Patrice, you are taking some students on anyway very shortly um, and you've been doing medical education as a special interest for a while as well. Um, so what are you looking for as a, from a medical student in, ter in terms of making the most of a placement as well? Well, I think I just want them to be interested and to just go start the placement and while they're in general practice. Um, I think for me, from what I've seen from my own background and from medics, um, we kind of just see like, you know, if you have a website, you have the front end and you have the back end. I think a lot of the time we just see the front end on the clinical aspects and rightly so, because, you know, that's what our primary aim is as a GP, to be very good clinicians, to, you know, get to know our patients, to treat them very well. And that's, that's great. But there is so much more to, um not just general practice but medicine in general and we're not taught really about finances um we may learn about the structure of the nhs to answer that interview question at medical school but how much do we really know about the structure how much do we know about commissioning how much do we know about services etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think for me i'm always keen for other medics and including myself to know about other aspects to a specialty um especially money wise and i know sometimes there are, there are certain types, there are doctors who are like obsessed with, they're really interested in money and the financial side and there's some medics who are just like, I don't really want to talk about money because medicine's a vocation and I really just want to get paid and I don't want to do anything else. But money, you know, it's very important to uh, living, so we have to talk about it. So a long story short, I would say that as a medical student, you should understand is the structure of general practice know about ctgs know about primary care changing know about commissioning know about all those things because that will definitely help you have a really good understanding and a good foundation for when you do decide to become a gp if you just um again like i was saying just someone who's interested enthusiastic everyone i did a post on linkedin uh, last week, I think, um, about publishing and being published as a medical student. When I took my, so I didn't get published as a medical student, shock horror, <laughs> um, I got published as an F1 and I got, I got more publications because I put and because I would speak to the consultant, I would just be really enthusiastic and um, I've had a publication come through now because the consultant still remembered me and he remembered that I wrote um, a literature review for him. So right now I've been published. So I think it's really important to be enthusiastic to get involved with projects. So there were loads of audits in our practice. There were loads of interesting ones as well. There are even quality improvement projects that um, you can get involved with that are not maybe as labor intensive or require so much work as an audit or doing a re-audit. Um, so I think 
when I look at a medical student coming in to work with me, yes, I want them to be very good clinically and sound clinically, but I also want them to understand other aspects of general, um, not just focusing solely on the medical aspect. So that would be one kind of thinking outside the box thing I would probably say. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's really what I would say for now. That sounds good. Um, I am conscious of time because we are pretty much coming to the end or about to start overrunning into the next session. But um, I think what we can uh, end it with is I have seen a couple of questions where it's like your favorite part and some disadvantages as well. So if you could all just go around saying one advantage and what one disadvantage, probably start with a disadvantage first and end with something more positive. Um, and then I think we could end it there. And I'm pretty sure, um, well, I'm pretty sure everyone would be happy to give out their socials or something um, for any further questions as well. Um, and any further questions as well, because I am the GP uh, lead for becoming a doctor, come to me as well. Um, but yeah, how about we go around and um, say a positive thing and a negative thing, um, or a disadvantage really, of a career in general practice. So Patrice, should we start with you? Um, so one positive I would say is career autonomy. It's a real buzzword. I love being in control of my own career versus, I don't want to be negative, but in the hospital, I was always told, you know, when, when you can work, you've got a rotor, et cetera. And it, I have that career autonomy. I can decide when, where, how, how I want to work, et cetera. So that's a real big positive for me. And I'll throw in work-life balance as well, just for fun of it. Um, in terms of a negative, I mean, I think with any job, there's and there's always time constraints. And sometimes I think like all GPs, we do get a little bit frustrated because we don't maybe always have the time to consult the way we want to with our patients. But then you can offset that with follow up. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily a negative, but um, sometimes there is a lot of pressure placed on GPs. And I think as doctors, sometimes that there, I mean, now with COVID, yeah there's been so much gratitude but sometimes it can often feel like a thankless job um so that might be one thing um, i probably put out there um but other than that i think that's it was there something else i was meant to talk about <laughs> what was the other part of the question yeah, it was positive and negative so yeah um Paul, would you like oh, to right, okay. <laughs> so um i think the negative is the paperwork really quite cumbersome um you know there's a lot of boxes that need to be ticked you know being a gp there's a lot of paper pushing but you know that that comes with the job and you have to be willing to accept that as part of the the working life for gp the positive is again everybody talks about it is the diversity that is there is within the job the opportunities that you can have to direct your you know your your career in the direction you want it to go into and you know there's a lot of gratitude out there despite a lot of complaints but you know there's a lot of happy patients who will love you till the end of your career hopefully um so that 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 i think is is something to look forward to yeah and that's good to know and tash i know that we're not gp yet or may we might not even end up being gp who knows but um Right now, if you were to say what was one positive thing that's leading you towards the profession and one um, negative or one disadvantage really of, of it, what would it be? Definitely the variety. Um, and I love being a bit of a know-it-all. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll know a, lot, a bit of everything on each specialty. Um, and also just the fact that I can have a life outside of medicine, like my career is so important to me, but when the time comes 10, 15 years time, having a family and seeing friends and avoiding burnout and prioritizing my mental health is something so important to me. So the fact that I don't have to work at midnight, I don't have to work on Sunday. I can if I want to, but I don't see that happening. I think five years sort of training, you know, F1, F2, and then GP specialty training, working in a hospital would be plenty of time for me quite happy to leave hospital after that <laughs> yeah. i think we just lost patrice for a second and i'm hoping that she'll come back but um i think we can leave it on a really good positive note like that um so yeah thank you very much for um coming and speaking with us today it was um really useful and really helpful um
Oh, nice. um, um, Tash, I'm happy to leave your um, Instagram and so on in the, and I'm happy to do the same with you, Kyle, if you so wish to choose to share it. Happy to put yeah. it in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Great, thank you, guys. Thank you.